Nicola is mine and mine alone. Upon defeating Moog Lord of Blood, the player is rewarded with his remembrance, and with this, they can choose between either one of the most broken weapons in the entire game, or hot water, that leaves a trail of lingering blood flames. <laughs> Hi boys, I'm Chris Crass, and I like asking the question, is it really that bad? And today, we'll be beating Elden Ring, blood boon only. Here are the rules. And let's get straight into it. Starting it off, I picked Prophet as my starting class for the good balance of Faith and Arcane before using Cheat Engine to spawn in Blood Boon. Now, I could have just went to Mugwin and easily used a Horse Cheese, but that would have left me out of a great boss fight, which wouldn't be that fun, would it? But anyway, since I wouldn't be able to use this spell right off the bat, I then made my way over to Carl, who, for some reason, didn't feel like cooperating. And so, while I pondered how else I was gonna get my runes, I then realized that all the grave robbing I did along the way was actually enough. No. Nope. <laughs> Never mind, never mind, we're good, we're good. From there, I then introduced this banished knight to a nearby chariot <laughs> and retrieving this dragon communion seal. Anyone who's ever said this spell was bad has probably never known how to use it. What, what most people do is that they lock on and then they throw this spell at a random dragon or something. What you're supposed to do with this spell is you're supposed to lock onto the ground and <clears throat> let the bleak do its thing. I mean, look at that. Finally being able to kill Grail for the first time in the challenge run is just honestly crazy. And using those runes I got from Grail, I stacked Arcane. Cause apparently this boost status build up, but enough setup. It's time for some action. And first on the hit list, Margit. Alright, let's do this. That's gonna be an issue. Okay, so it's a bit slower than I thought. Oh. Now, I will admit, this fight was much harder than I expected. Between the spell's deceptively long windup and Margaret's tendency to not stay still and or dodge. However, nothing a bit of positioning and parries couldn't fix. GG. Goodbye. Ooh. Now, where Margaret had problems staying put, Godric, on the other hand, had no such issue. I'd pepper his 50 plus toes, and Bro didn't even seem to care. Rather, he bathed in it, like a Chinese man in a hot tub, just letting all that sink in. Phase 2 practically made things even easier, as every time I saw a dragon move, I knew it was my cue to punish. Pair that up with all the openings that carried over from phase one, and we've got ourselves an easy first try. You doused my hot water. <laughs> it was now time for the Urnia. Here, I grabbed the two finger talisman, had EG upgrade my seal to plus four, and slayed this putrid avatar really quick. GG! Upon arriving at Rinala's doorstep, I'd encounter a bit of issues with books, but more importantly, with the boss herself. And though the latter was solved by more strategically timing my shots, 
The same could not be said about the second phase. How do I say this? She was a bit jumpy, which would be annoying enough, but to top it off, she was also suspiciously good at punishing my openings. Ow. And I didn't like that. So, after a few unsuccessful no, attempts, no, no. I ended up going all the way to Altus, grabbing the Ritual Sword and Fire Scorpion Charm before heading straight for Red Main. And against Radon, this spell was honestly pretty good. And this fight actually could have ended on the third attempt. I did say could have. Oh, the green! Now for phase one, you know the deal. Run back to reset his aggro and start peppering his legs, or what's left of them anyway. Honestly, there's not much I could say. Every attack you think is punishable is, and his larger frame makes it an easy target for bleed procs. Now phase two was a bit trickier. Thanks to the meatball uplift, I'd get an easy proc. But after that, this last stretch would be the hardest part, in part due to increased resistances, but also cuts of his signature rush and drill attack, which look amazing for sure, but last so long that the bleed just couldn't build up. Oh well. Ya goofy bastard, die! It was now time for a bit of setup. Grab Somber 6 and Golden Vow from Mount Galmir, Flame grab me strength from Kaelid, did Varys quest really quick, and kill this invader for the White Mask. Die already! Jesus Christ! Oh my god. Did I put it on? No. Instead, I slapped the helmet's effects on my own via cheat engine and set the weight values to match. Anyway, let me show you how to get the Flock's Talisman in 7 seconds. Nile, Gowry, Millicent, Shaded Castle, Give Arm, Godskin Apostle, Kill Amputee, Kill Their Dad, and boom, there you go. Now geared up, we then challenge Tree Senti. Dragon Flavor. Oh. Here I'd buff up and hopefully land three shots. This would give me an early proc, and the fight would go on from there. Thinking about it now, I could have just cheesed him by running away and periodically jump scaring him with boiled water. God, that sounds awful. But oh well. It was here where I'd learned to free aim long range. You might be thinking, then why not just lock on? Well, you see, you'd want both the projectile and blood pool to connect for maximum impact. This can definitely be achieved while locked on. However, free aiming gives you more control over where the arc lands without the need of perfect positioning. This will come in handy much later on. This is the one, come on, come on, come on! Nice! Let's go! With this, I then make it into the capital. And as much as I'd like to go waterboard Morgoth right now, I needed a few things from the sewers. I swear to god, no other developer would ever put this much effort into what is essentially the poo poo zone. Anyway, here I get myself the early somber 7. Die! Got lost in this dungeon for 20 minutes. Where the f is this dude? Fighting the boss. Let's create a barrier for the dogs. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh, that went a lot quicker than I thought. Before getting a plus nine seal and confronting Ghost Free. Speaking of ghosts, I don't reckon they can bleed. And so, we spam. Bye bye. Morgoth, on the other hand, very much can bleed. And so, I once again tried using parries to hold him in place. However, this time, it didn't seem to be as effective. But just before I thought bleeding him would be an issue, Bro actually has a tendency to stand in place quite a bit. Take that. And with this, I'd get the procs I needed to eke out a victory. Nice. Let's go, GG. You stepped on hot water. After this, I then thought, hey, I already have the keys to Mogwin. And as I remember, for a Lord of Blood, Moog's pretty weak to bleed. And that maybe, it's time for a new Lord to step up. What could go wrong, I thought. A lot of things, actually. No! As a matter of fact, this fight ended up being the hardest encounter of the entire Ow. round, and it might not be for the reason you'd expect. But before we get into that, this fight ended up getting so bad <laughs> that I decided to go for Fire Giant instead and actually managed to kill him. So let's talk about that. This Colossal Jerk has a 50% resistance to fire damage, and with a bleed bar that's hard to crack even in normal circumstances, from the get-go, it was easy to see that this fight would be an issue. But the worst part was that as big as he is, his feet, or his hands in phase two, are the only real targets here. And they tend to shuffle around a lot. 
And so, the strategy was simple. Keep up the pressure, and to bleed the right attacks. I caught on pretty fast, and actually could have won on my 6th attempt. But of course, due to fire giant reasons. Oh my god. Don't kill me, 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 don't kill me. No! Ah! This victory was sadly cut short. Anyways, on the final attempt, the main attacks I look out for were the jumping slam, hard slam, double stomp, ankle break, and burn of flame. Keep this up for about, say, seven minutes, and you've officially made not wearing shoes the worst decision of his entire life. With this, he'll transition into phase two, and gladly take out a huge chunk of his own HP, which is great for us, honestly. Here, we'll punish the two scripted attacks, the flame pillars, followed by the eruption, with both attacks holding him still just long enough to proc twice. Also, I've noticed that, for whatever reason, bleeding him in second phase does a ton more damage, but hey, I'm not complaining. Anyway, before you think this fight's over, just like Radon, this final stretch would be the hardest part. Cause I only had 30 vigor, and after coming so far, I wasn't gonna risk a thing. And so, I then popped a great group, punished every melee attack I could, which weren't many cause he'd rather use fire spells, before finally... One more bleed, come on, please. Yeah! 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 Uh. Alright, back to Moog. Now, as I mentioned, at first, I thought this fight would be easy, as most of us know him to be a big, dumb, slow target. And though that is sort of true, this didn't make the fight easy. Let me explain. Firstly, his fire resistance is off the charts, making my damage borderline useless and forcing me to solely rely on bleed. Secondly, instead of bleeding like a normal person, Moog only has 7.5% of his HP removed per proc, which might not seem like much, but if you run the numbers, you'll see that he can take about 40% more procs than the average boss. And since he regenerates roughly 30% HP at the start of phase two, that means 130% divided by 7.5 and round that up, 18 total procs. Most of which will have to be done at max resistance. And as the final nail in the coffin, whenever he does decide to bleed, he also gets a 20% boost in damage for 20 seconds. Cool. Firstly, we'll need our Moog Essentials. Tear, Shackle, Check. With this, we'll enter the fight. In Phase 1, his openings are quite numerous, being the Fate, the Stab, the Thrust, the Count, and the Flashbang. Using these, I'd script the fight. Bleed him a minimum of two times, punish the countdown, Shackle, punish that, wait for him to count again, Shackle once more, and after a bit more effort, we'll drain the Flask and Phase 2 begins. Doing this makes getting past Phase 1 relatively consistent and harmless. Except for when he does the Blood Rain. this move in particular. Anyways, here comes the hard part. Entering phase two, Moog has already reached his max bleed resist. And though his attack openings are still numerous, the combo strings are much longer. Combine this with his tendency to fly around a lot, and this makes things very difficult to apply constant pressure, constantly interrupting the progress of buildup and grossly prolonging the fight. Honestly, the best possible move he could do is the flashbang, as it guarantees that he actually stays still for once and is our best bet to proc bleed. However, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we got this attack. And for the lack of a better term, Let's call this the whip. Now there's two things you need to know about the whip. One, it's fast enough to cancel the attack. And two, it loves appearing after any combo end, presumably to punish players from heavy attacking. You know what that means? Unavoidable, guaranteed damage. This and the quick flash, which doesn't happen nearly as often, would be the biggest thorn in my sight. They'd only appear about 30% of the time, but when you're in a really long boss fight, that number really starts to add up, eventually getting so bad that it practically forced me to near no-hit everything else, just so I could save the flash to tank them. Eventually though, I persevered, getting Moog one and a half lead procs away before running out of flask and tragically dying. Ah uh, yes, we meet again old friends. And now, time to do that all over again. But before that, here's a tip that helped me survive fighting Moog for long periods of time. And hopefully, they might help you out as well. When avoiding the blood explosions, I look to my character instead of the trident itself. Dodging the initial ground stab, and as the rolling animation ends, I count one. Let's try that again. One. And as for the falling stab, I count one, two. Oh, and also, strafe the jumping slam.
I'm on the floor, bro. That took three hours. Ah. Ah. Give me that drip. Bro, his fit is too fresh, bro. I just need one of you. Okay, that should be enough. Damn, I look good. All right, with the hardest boss down, I then made my way towards Castle Soul, and entering the boss fog, I welcomed Nial with a bleed proc, used the arc of my spell to kill both phantoms at once, and reduced Nial's HP to 30% before the fight even really began. Man, Mo almost made me forgot just how good this spell was. GG. With the secret medallion acquired, I then made my way onto the Halic Tree. And once there, I met up with Loretta, and eventually, beat her by parrying her jumping attack and every other slow move you know of. But looking back, I should have just spammed, cause this boss jumps around a lot, and doing this made the fight last so much longer than it ever should have. Let's go! Anyways, I then got the Dragon Shield Talisman, touched Melania's grace, and bounced. I then resumed the main course, and on it lies noodles and dumplings. First, as always, I'll drug them, before buffing up and peppering the dumpling. Then, while he wakes up, I'll guide him to the wall, and completely season that bad boy. Before going back and taking care of the noodle. Nice. From there, I'd sleep the long one, and easily take care of the round one via parries and pillar. GG! Now obviously, Malekith was up next, but don't get your hopes up, as this was just a regular ass Malekith fight. In phase 1, I punished a long sweep, used this goofy ass maneuver I learned while speedrunning Elden Ring Glitchless, my record is 95 minutes by the way, and other stuff. Well, and as for phase 2, you already knew free aiming wasn't an option, but that didn't matter, as his HP is just so low that I could just spam without issue. Plus, he just couldn't dodge the arc of the spell. One more hit. GG. Next up, the thickest dragon in all the lands. Between. Now this guy may have high bleep resist, but with a frame built like that, it doesn't even matter. Bro has the mobility stat of a boulder, and because of that, with the help of free aiming, it's near impossible to miss. And with that, we punish the lightning storm, flame breaths, and everything in between with incredible uptime. The bleed was just devouring this boss, and the fire damage wasn't even half bad. Sure, he starts teleporting a bit in phase 2, but once he starts spitting fire or summoning lightning again, it's very much the same thing. Honestly, besides that one time I died at the very end, this has got to be one of the most enjoyable ways I've ever been classy. Oh, let's go! We're getting at least one blade. Alright, we can get two attacks off right here. GG! You big grainy f It was now time for our next supersized boss, our favorite volcanic snake boy, Rykard. Now you may notice that this guy is literally secreting lava, and from that alone, you already know what that means. And so, once again, we'll be relying solely on bleed. Nice. Okay. But hey, at least due to his intense frame, this won't be as much of an issue. Ow. Moving on, the next biggest issue was definitely the lava stun. Oh god. A viewer of mine recommended I wear some armor and just poise through. And though that was a solid plan, after a few attempts of doing so, I thought, yeah, this is extremely lame. And settled for a different idea. I walked to the edge of the lava pool, aimed at this specific angle, and voila. This took a bit of practice, but not long after, I got the hang of it. With this, I punished the head slam, the grab, the stagger, 
and most commonly, the snake bites. The main idea being to dodge dimensioned attacks before creeping into position as the spell is being cast. Nice. Three minutes later, I have now reached phase two. I'll be doing the same thing, but with a different set of punishes, being the Ranko Call, the Stab Attack that appears after two regular Sword Swipes, and the Skull Rain Summon, in which the latter two require a bit more spacing as the pool tends to expand during these attacks. Reaching 40% HP, we've reached the final stretch. Here, the snake from phase 1 makes its return, frequently appearing mid-combo to ruin our day. At first, this just seemed a bit annoying to me. However, I then realized that this just meant even more openings to punish. It's just a random attempt of the day. Am I, am I accidentally just gonna kill this guy? Dude, ain't no way. What the f***? <laughs> GG, Rykard! Holy crap! <laughs> Dead. Alright, one last thing before the Ashen Trio. It's Melania time, boys. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I spent the first two hours of attempts doing what I usually do on these challenges, constantly pairing Melania and punishing mostly her staggers, before after way too long realizing, what am I even doing? Half the time this spell doesn't even connect, and even when it does, this is a terrible way to build up lead. I guess I'm just so used to resorting to parries that it's just become a habit at this point. Anyways, parrying became more of a defensive maneuver as I began casting the spell more frequently, punishing the up-down attack, the slam, and also the lower walk, trying my best to land the flames just at Melania's feet for that extra buildup. Though, blatantly spamming it wasn't a bad idea either. Melania is weak to fire and gets caught on the arc. Phase 2 is next, and here I start off by running away and punishing the Scarlet Blue. And before you ask, yes, free aiming is necessary. From there, the up down attack and the flower slam are my best friends. And if you're anticipating any bleed procs, give up now. Cause after scrubbing through all the footage, and I mean all of it, she only ever bled twice in phase two. Anyway, did I mention she did the flower bomb like four more times? He stays still after he says the word Lord, right? Oh, he's after he says affairs? All right, all right, thanks. God damn it!
you. You know, there's a reason I never voice over Gideon's fight, and that's because there's literally nothing to talk about. Moving on, Godfrey time. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint, but this spell is pretty bad against Godfrey. Not horrendous or anything, just the equivalent of taking an R2 amount of time to do an R1 amount of damage. Also, his bleed resist is pretty dang high for a dude that's a quarter, then half naked. Not that it's even of any use. All in all, this fight just felt like a painfully mediocre and drawn out Godfrey fight. No, dude, what the f you think you're doing? Shoot! Shoot! Alright, it's time to end this thing once and for all, but I'm not gonna lie. For this final fight, there isn't much to say. They both can't bleed, Radagon was simply a parry marathon, and as for Mr. Beast, you'll find out soon enough. So without further ado, let me just show you. We're gonna have to just mow him down with the fire damage. Yo guys, I'm actually just really bored right now. Whoops. Oh God. Well, I guess I found another reason to throw shit on the ground now. Alright boys, it's time to lock in. Ain't no way, buddy. Ain't no way. Yo! Let's go! I killed God with hot water. <laughs> Alright, boys. It's time for the review. Now, I'm gonna be completely honest. This spell is by no means OP. The cast speed is deceptively long, and though it possesses bleed, it's not even the best applier of that. Just get a simple plus 25 twin blade with seppuku on it, and that shit will proc things three times faster. So let's go back to the intro of this video. Ignoring the fact that you can duplicate remembrances, if what you're looking for is a downright broken weapon to absolutely cheese the game with, the Great Spear will be your best pick, no doubt about it. However, if you're like me, and obliterating bosses within seconds isn't oh, your wow. idea of a fun time, 
you should definitely give this spell a try. After beating the entire game with it, I can confidently say that, for a lot of it, it was quite enjoyable. Sure, it's not the fastest procker in the world, but as someone who often thinks bleed is way too OP at times, I feel this strikes a nice balance. The damage to FP ratio is also quite generous, so much so that I actually could have beaten most of the game without even free aiming, though that would have been significantly less fun. Not to mention the visuals. Just look at it. You literally rip open a portal, grab a chunk out of the formless mother, and douse your enemies in the boiling blood of an outer god. It does not get more metal than this, folks. Here's a few scenarios I recommend anyone could use this spell in. Whenever the noble starts rolling, the plassy fight, seriously, try it. It's a genuinely enjoyable way to fight him. Nayal, right at the start of Fire Giant Phase 2, and also a pretty goofy way to beat Rikard if you like. But also, more general scenarios, such as multi boss fights. It covers large ground, has a lingering bleed AoE, and it can pierce. Fast boss fights, since they cannot out dodge the arc, and co op, as you can support your team with bleed procs from afar. And finally, this spell's hidden talent to utterly annihilate trash mobs. Throw this at any dog, soldier, albinaric, and even some mini bosses, and holy shit, it's just game over. They are physically unable to move, only capable of helplessly struggling before succumbing to either blood loss or third degree burns. So much so that I actually use this as a pseudo wave of gold replacement for rune farming. Anyways, enough gushing. Sure, it may not be the most beginner friendly or the most powerful thing ever, but my god is the spell fun to use. Anyone who says the spell is mediocre has never tried free aiming it, because if they did, they'd know that this adds an entire layer of depth to the combat. Just don't use it on move. This spell gets a B for Blood Boon, and to anyone who's willing to do a bit of free aiming, I highly recommend you give this spell a try. And finally, is Blood Boon really that bad? Fuck no.